Thank God. God bless America. God, <laughs> America needs all the help she can get. Um, all the voices that speak to us that bring us together rather than tear us apart. In fact, that's what we're going to be talking about. We're in our journey uh, in the book of Acts called Unstoppable, looking at the power of the Holy Spirit in this dynamic group of people that were empowered. They changed personally. They changed their community. They changed the world. And we're looking for some Acts to people that will be in this day and age and filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to be transformed personally and to transfer our community, our state, our nation, and to be a force for God on the earth. That you would be unstoppable like the Church of Acts was unstoppable. And today we're talking about the power of unity, uh, which is very appropriate as we approach a day that honors a voice for unity in our culture, in our world, that is respected and revered as a voice for unity. Um, we've been teaching over the last few weeks the essentials, just a starting point of the year to look down at our roots and make sure that we've got good roots for this year, because how many would like to grow this year? <laughs> yeah. So you, uh, if you want to grow, you've got to check your roots. And from time to time, you've got to look down and make sure you are rooted and grounded so that you can grow. And there are three essential habits we've been talking about. We've been talking about the importance of scheduling and um, taking time for Jesus by having a daily meeting with God for prayer, uh, meditation, scripture, being filled with the Holy Spirit, that each day you take time to reorient spiritually, connect with God. Two, regularly meeting with God's family large, like you're doing now, hundreds, thousands, and small, which we're emphasizing today as well, with all of our tables that are calling you to make a step and join a community uh, that knows your name, that you know their name, that you pray for them, that they pray for you. So the Acts Church was large, in large gatherings, small, in house-to-house -house gatherings, and so should ours be, and then sharing God's love everywhere. So we talked about on the first week of the year, January 1, we talked about the importance of a daily meeting with God. Last week, as we were in Acts 8, because we're studying the chapter that we are reading together, encouraging everyone to read a chapter a day, uh, because a chapter a day keeps the devil away. <laughs> a chapter in the book of Acts to read about this exciting church, and then the chapter that we're on on the weekends, we're just taking that chapter as our theme scripture for that day. And so the first one, we talked about a daily meeting with God. Last week, we talked about sharing God's love everywhere from Acts 8 to never have an excuse not to share your faith. Today, we're really emphasizing on meeting with God's people regularly because God would like to keep you united with God's people and the devil would like you to be divided from God's people. Uh, you notice when you read the book of Acts, uh, how many times it talks about being in one accord? Jesus said, go into the upper room, and they went into the upper room to pray, and when they prayed, they were in one accord, Acts 1. In Acts 2, before the Holy Spirit power came into that room, they were in one place, and they were in one accord. Uh, and that's important. How many would agree that we are in one place? That's not too hard. But how many would agree that you can be in one place and not be in one accord? Any married folk here? <laughs> Any, you, this, this brother just said Thanksgiving. I don't know. There's a testimony there somewhere, but that's true. But the Spirit moves in great power when God's people are united. Jesus prayed in Acts, no, in John 17 his high prayer as the high priestly prayer for the church. He said, I pray that my people would be united like I am united to the Heavenly Father. That's very close. Now, the enemy heard that and has been trying to bring disagreements and division ever since then. He would like to divide you from your friends. He would like there to be disagreements in your marriage. He'd like there to be disagreements in the church. He'd like there to be disagreements in the state. He'd like there to be disagreements in the, in the government. He is, he is the master of disaster. And he loves disagreement. So it's interesting, as we come to the 15th chapter of Acts, that the whole chapter is about disagreement. There are two stories. 
both of them have to do with good people, godly people, who didn't agree with each other. So let's launch in to Acts 15 and see this. When disagreement comes, that's the enemy at work. When unity comes, that's the work of the Spirit. Here's how Acts 15 begins. Paul and Barnabas were up in, uh, in Antioch, and they were ministering, and some people came from Judea to Antioch, and here was their message. Different than Paul's message. They said, okay, you people have got it all wrong. To really be saved... To really be connected to God, you've got to follow the law of Moses. In particular, you need to get circumcised. So, this was different than what Paul was teaching. And this brought Paul into sharp di dispute. And so there's, con there's disagreement. There's one people saying one thing and one people saying another thing. And notice what they do. This is there's wisdom here. They went down or went up to Jerusalem. Even though geographically they may have been going down, uh, when they would talk about going to Jerusalem, it's always going up because it would be up a hill and it was ascending. There was, the spirit, Jerusalem was like a higher place. And so they went up to Jerusalem to meet with, who did they go to meet with? What's the scripture say? Who did they meet with? Apostles and elders. So here, the Bible teaches us this, that when you can't see eye to eye with someone, you must deal face-to-face. -face. I'll say that again. Because we're talking about unity and disagreements and overcoming disagreements. When you can't see eye-to-eye, -eye, you must deal face-to-face. -face. So the scripture teaches us that if we have something against each other, that we must first try to deal with it, and then if we can't, to involve others. Notice that they didn't go to their friends. They went to spiritually mature wise people. To overcome disputes, you often have to seek for wisdom from wiser people. So they went to the elders, they went to the apostles, and they said, hey, we have this dispute, we have this uh, debate. Now, when they were in Jerusalem, there were several leading voices in the Jerusalem church. This is the early church, the book of Acts. Uh, can you think of any of the leaders that may have been at that meeting that were leading the church in Jerusalem? James was one. I heard that. I heard both names, actually. I heard James and I heard Peter. They, so we're going to talk about both those guys are in this chapter. Uh, remember Peter? Uh, Peter was um, used, if you're reading through the book of Acts with us, in Acts 10, he was used by the Lord to go and tell non Jewish people, Gentile people, about Jesus. He went to Cornelius' house. Cornelius was an Italian. John Paolo always likes that the Italians are in the Bible. He's always like pro. And, and those of you that may be new to the church, you may or may not know that. When we were just very small, we only had a few people. One of my first Sundays, I just stood up and said, I got a prayer request. We need to pray for more Italians. <laughs> Two reasons. One is, if Italians love you, they really love you. You don't want to get sideways with them. But if they love you, they really love you. And I love Italian food. Now, now, actually God has brought us too many Italians. <laughs> Both my son-in-laws are Italian, John Paul is an Italian, I got Italians. All, that's too, I'm just, okay, Lord, that's too much blessing. <laughs> but in Acts 10, Peter went to Italians, they were non-Jewish people, and he was talking to them just like I'm talking to you. And the power of the Holy Spirit came into the room, just like in Acts chapter 2, when the room was filled with Jewish people, now Gentile people receive the power of the Holy Spirit. So as Peter stands up, he's, he's, he's talking about that. And they're in the council debating, is it, is it keeping religious rules that saves you? Or is it a relationship with Jesus that saves you? That's the, and that's still an issue for some people today. There are some people trying to earn their way to God by keeping religious rules. And there are religions that say if you keep these rules, you will find your way to God. I thank God for the gospel that was defended in this council in Jerusalem because when Peter stands up, here's what he says. He speaks up and says, hey, when I was there in Cornelius' house, I learned that God did not discriminate between Jews and Gentiles. He purified their hearts by faith. Everybody say, by faith. by faith. 
Did he purify them by keeping the law of Moses? No, they were purified how? By faith. And so he's reminding them about that. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the Gentiles a yoke? And a yoke was not just an instrument of our, uh, agriculture to yoke the oxen. A yoke actually was a teaching. When Jesus says, my yoke is easy, he's saying, my teaching, which was the grace of God, will be easy and not hard. He says, now there's a yoke, and you're trying to put this heavy yoke, which is the yoke of the law of Moses. You're trying to put that yoke on uh, our, these Gentile people. And then notice what he says. Neither we nor our ancestors could keep that. He says, we all, we all, the law of Moses, we all broke it. I would say probably here in this room that everyone has probably broken one of the Ten Commandments at some time. No amens, but it's just true. I know you guys. <laughs> Why are you trying to put this heavy law on these Gentiles in Antioch when we all know, let's all be honest, we've all broken that law. His answer, verse 11, no one, it's probably added by the translators, but I love that there's an explanation point there. When someone says to you, you need to be religious to reach God, our answer is no. no. Exclamation point. We believe this. It is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. Now let's say this. Through grace, grace. by faith. Let's try it again. Through grace, grace. by faith. That's what he's saying. That's what Paul was teaching. And so he's lining up with Paul and saying, okay, we need to understand it is the grace of God. And I'm so glad for that because uh, I can't keep the law of Moses. Neither can you. The message of Christianity is not us trying to reach up to reach God, but God reaching down and getting us where we were and pulling us up to where he is. That's what grace is. Grace is unmerited favor, God reaching towards you. Faith is your arm that reaches out and receives that grace and receives it into yourself. Through grace, by faith. Now, there was another name, a leader in the church. Peter stood up, and the other name was? James. Now, James is interesting. James was a, um, a brother or half-brother, depending on how you look at it. He was a son of Mary and Joseph. So he was a brother or a half-brother of Jesus. He did not follow Jesus as a disciple until after the crucifixion and the resurrection. So all Jesus' ministry, he had this brother named James who said, oh, you know, Jesus. In fact, one day, James came to visit Jesus, and Jesus said to the people in the room, you're more my brothers than that guy out there. Yeah. So James now, after the crucifixion, his mother was there. Mary saw Jesus die. And she came back and said, he's dead. And then he met Jesus. He was one of the 500 people that met Jesus and said, wow, there's something to this. <laughs> my, my brother, my older brother, <laughs> died and came back. He's worth following. This is true. This is true. If any of you have brothers or sisters, they need to hear the message of crucifixion and resurrection because it will change their world. If they meet the resurrected Jesus, it will change their world. So James meets the resurrected Jesus. He becomes a leader now in the church that's in Jerusalem. And he kind of sums up the meeting. He talks to them and he says, uh, brothers, I want you to listen to me. Simon Peter has described for us what happened in Acts chapter 10. He's described it, how God first intervened uh, to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. He says, God's obviously doing something here. And he says, I, I want you to know my judgment about this is that it wouldn't be right for us to make it too difficult for people to come to God. That's, this is great wisdom right here. In fact, if you're in a disagreement with anyone, here's a great question to ask yourself. Is my position in this disagreement making it difficult for anyone to find their way to God? Say that again. Listen, you're in a disagreement. Sometimes your ego, I'll say my ego because it's me. I'm involved in this too. My ego, my pride, my hurt. 
I can be so entrenched in my position that I can actually make it difficult for someone to reach God? This is a great question. So he said, I don't want to make it difficult, but watch what he does next. Very interesting. He's going to say, okay, it is by faith through grace that people come to God. But now he's going to reach back beyond the law of Moses and say there are some universal laws that we recommend and, and ask you to maintain. There is a law that is written, the Bible talks in the book of Romans, on our heart. There are some things that are right. Every relationship has rules. And actually, your relationship with God has some rules. You should know that. Because, yeah, we're saved by grace, but there's some rules. I love your pastor, that's one. That's, that's not, that's not, no, love everyone. I would, you know, that's how I, I would get into love everyone. But there are. And so he says, okay, there are, there, are, there are three, some of you will call them four, but here's what he says. I want you to send out a letter to our friends, and I want you to say these things to them. Tell them that they should abstain from food polluted, polluted by, by idols. They should abstain from sexual immorality. And they should abstain from eating meat that is strangled and still has its blood in it. Some people count four things. I think there are three things here. And these things transcend the law of Moses. They're before Moses. Idolatry. Let's stay away from it. Idolatry finds its roots in Genesis 3. When, a, when Adam and Eve listen to the voice of the serpent rather than the voice of the Lord. Idolatry is putting another voice in front of God's voice. Another image in front of God's image. That's what idolatry is. And he says, okay, we're going to ask you to stay away from that. We're going to ask you to stay from sexual immorality. Um, is there sexual immorality in the book of Genesis? Yes, there is. There is there's two expressions of sexuality. In the book of Genesis, there's sexuality inside marriage, which is blessed. And every occasion of sexuality outside of marriage, which is sexual immorality, is a mess. It ends up in a mess. It messes people up. And so this law transcends the law of Moses. And then um, this abstaining from food that is contaminated or contains blood actually goes back. This Genesis 9 is Noah. Uh, let me ask this question. Was Noah Jewish? You got, that's, you heard your good strong answer. You, you, it's like you knew I was going to, were you in the first service? That's how you know the answer so quickly, right? He wasn't. Because when did the Jewish nation start? After him. How about Adam? Eve. So these laws he's going back to transcend Moses. And he said when they came off the ark, they said, God said to Noah, you can eat meat. So if you're vegetarian or vegan, that's okay. But if you're a carnivore, you can eat. No amens, but it's true. I heard one amen in the whole house, but you can legitimately. He said, but when you take that, I don't want you. Here's to Noah, the law given to Noah. Do not eat any meat that still has, interesting phrase, lifeblood in it. Because the thinking was that life was in the blood, and that you would take life from the animal by taking the blood, strangling the animal, taking the blood from the animal. And what the teaching is, is that life comes from God, and life belongs to God, and you can't do a circumvent around that by taking the blood of animals. Interesting, when the Passover, Paschal lamb was sacrificed, they exsanguated it. They took all the blood out, they put the blood on the doorposts because that life belongs to God. And what they were saying is, hey, we're going back. We want you to know there are some laws that are you know, universal laws. It's almost like a, a middle ground they're finding, though. Yes, you're saved by grace, but there are some three things we're going to, three or four things we're going to ask you to take. And when they came to this decision, I love this verse, that it pleased the Holy Spirit, which is a great, when you have a disagreement with someone, here's, quit trying to win the argument and start saying what would please the Holy Spirit. That is good. Thank you very much. Like, okay, I'm going to, I'm, my, my ego, my anger, my pride, I'm going to win my position, but is it pleasing to the Holy Spirit? Well, when they said this, it's by grace, by faith, keep these three laws, three or four laws. This pleased the whole assembly and it pleased the Holy Spirit. So there's, and it was resolved fairly quickly. So they had this disagreement in Antioch. They came down to Jerusalem. They had a meeting. They all hashed it out. And they came up with a solution. And it was resolved. So the disagreement. So when you find yourself in a state of disagreement, you need to move out of that state. 
I'm going to say that again. Some of you must have dozed off a little bit. They, they say when you speak every seven minutes, your mind takes a break. So you must have been on your break about that. When you find yourself in a state of disagreement, you need to move out of that state. It's just like I say to all of our friends that are visiting us from other states, you should move out of your state. You should join us here in the great state of Florida. Amen. The greatest state in the union. It's great. And I know some of you go, no, don't let them come. I say, no, let them come. I love them. I, lo I love waiting for, for red lights. I, lo I love when there's a long line in front of me. I say, Lord, thank you for sending all these people to pay my taxes. I love them so much. Lord, thank you. Send more to us. <laughs> that not, that's not in my notes, but I just... I don't even think that was prophecy. I think that was, like Paul said sometimes, I just said that by myself. That was me. No, I just said that by myself. So this disagreement was solved very quick. Now there's another story. There's two stories, primary stories in Acts 15. One is the story of the Council of Jerusalem, this disagreement. The second is a personal um, disagreement that took years to be resolved. And it's at the end of the story. It's about Paul and Barnabas. Here's it is. When we come to the end of the chapter, Paul and Barnabas um, are talking. And they say, hey, you know, it would be a great idea. We took this first missionary journey together. It was so successful. We went and we established churches. And people are filled with the Holy Spirit. And they're changing their communities with the love of God. Let's go just check on. Let's, let's see how they're doing. And then Barnabas said, you know, Paul, what I'd like to do is, um, you know the guy we took with us on our first journey, uh, John Mark? I'd like to take him with me again. And Paul said, not in your life. Paul did not think it wise. Here's what happened in Acts 13. You can read about it. And if you have read Acts 13, you know that they got midway through their first journey with this young man named Mark. And we don't know the real reason, but Mark abandoned the trip. And Paul did not like it very much. Paul looked at him as a quitter, and Paul did not like quitters. So I, you, can, you can just imagine the conversation that Paul and Barnabas are having. Paul says, he's a quitter. We cannot have quitters on our mission. We need people that are dedicated. Didn't Jesus say, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not worthy? Didn't Jesus say that, Barnabas? And Barnabas said, Paul, when nobody would have anything to do with you because of the mistakes you made, I was the guy that came and got you. Did you forget that? And we just were in the council of Jerusalem. And didn't Peter stand up? And didn't Peter deny Jesus? One or two times? Maybe three? And Jesus brought him back on board. You can see this conversation. But the end of the conversation is they had such a sharp disagreement that they broke up the band. Now, this is Paul, Apostle Paul and Apostle Barnabas. And they, there's it's such a disagreement that Barnabas takes Mark and they sail off. And Paul, and for the rest of the book of Acts, we're going to read about Paul and Silas because of this disagreement. And the believers didn't know what to do with it. So they just commended them to the Lord in the grace of God. That's actually a good phrase right there. It really is. So say me and uh, John Paul are like really duking it out in the church. I did wrestle him recently. Can we show that video? I actually have the video. Sometime I will weave it into a sermon and you will see me wrestling John Paul. And you'll see my mighty victory that I won. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, th because that's how we solve our disagreements in our staff. <laughs> if Paul and Barnabas just had wrestled it out, then we would have a much better... No. No, but say, John Paul and I, and, and it's known in the church. It creates tension. Two, spi two spiritual leaders fight, and they can't agree. And, and Paul's in, not in your life. And John Bar Barnabas says, well, you, yes, there should be grace for this. And so the people of the community say, okay, we're just going to commend you to the Lord and to the grace of God. Sometimes when you have a disagreement with someone, you have to do that. You, you can only be in charge of you. The only do door of relationship that you can keep open is your door. You cannot change the attitude of someone else. So sometimes you just have to say, Grace, 
I need God's grace. You need God's grace. And that was a great thing for them uh, to do as they commended him. So as we just wrap up, let me just say a few things about these disagreements. One is that good and godly people can have disagreements. Council of Jerusalem, those were godly leaders. Um, Wherever there is humanity, there will be disagreements. Because wherever there is humanity, the enemy of our souls is working to try to get us into disagreements. The Spirit of God would like you to be in unity. The enemy would like you to be in disagreement. So, good people. In fact, the Bible says that Paul and Barnabas, these were leaders. They had such a sharp, there's the language, sharp disagreement that they parted company. They literally didn't travel together anymore because of this sharp disagreement. Was Paul a good guy? Was Barnabas a good guy? Who do you think was right? Yeah, I think so too. I'm with Barnabas on this one. I, I like Bar- Barnabas. Is, I like him. As, his name means son of encouragement. And when nobody would touch Paul, he was the one that went and got Paul. And when Paul like threw John Mark out the door, yeah, Paul probably didn't know. Looking back, we would know this, but Paul probably didn't know. Um, you know the gospel. How many gospels are there? Four gospels. And what are they? There's. Oh, that's all. You, you just need number two. He probably didn't know that this young man would become such a close friend of Peter and would become uh, an apostle himself that would write a book of the Bible. And Paul wouldn't have anything to do with him. I think maybe Paul was wrong on this one. But they have this sharp disagreement. Even good people can do that. When you have a disagreement, look for common ground. Look for for a middle ground. Because there's your position, there's their position, and then there is... Maybe something you can agree on. In the Council of Jerusalem, they firmly said, we are saved through grace by faith. That's what they said. But we want you to know that there are some rules. That that seems to be a compromised position to me, and I think there is some valid logic for that. They found some common ground. Now, Paul and Barnabas could have found common ground, but did they? No, they parted company. Barnabas's heart was full of grace. Paul's heart was not. He was hard. Paul was hard. Paul was not. Aren't you glad Paul is not our Savior? Paul's like y'all. Paul's like y'all. He got, he got issues. And he had an issue with John Mark. He could have found, they could have resolved this fairly quickly. He could have had a, the grace of God could have softened his heart. But it didn't. He, he didn't look for common ground. Don't let differences destroy love. This is the main thing. In a marriage, don't let differences destroy love. Don't, in, a, in a church, don't let... Di- Some churches are known as fighting churches. Yeah, there's a song out. It's a hymn. You ever, Everybody was kung fu fighting. That's a, that's a some church. That's a church hymn. That's a church hymn in some churches. Those cats were fast as lightning. That's, okay, I wasn't even in the first service. That was a second service a little bit right there. This came in. Now, remember the prayer that the friends in Antioch prayed over Paul and Barnabas. What did they pray? Remember? Do I have to go back? What did they pray? Before they sent him out, they prayed. They committed them to the Lord and to... Okay, somebody's saying it. You say it a little louder so people can hear. Grace. Grace. They committed to grace. And I think that that prayer was answered. It just took a long time. About a decade later, 10 years after Paul would have nothing to do with Mark, he writes to the Colossians... Uh, his friend's in Colossae, in the book of Colossians, and he says, okay, I've got this fellow prisoner who's with me, and he sends greetings, and also Mark, and when Mark comes to you, because this guy's in jail, he's not coming to you, when Mark comes to you, I want you to do what? I want you to... Can you see his heart softening? This is the guy he would have nothing to do with. About seven years after he wrote this, in the last letter that we have from him, which is 2 Timothy, he wrote this. Get Mark. Could you please, could you get Mark? Could you bring him to be with me? Because he helps me in my ministry. 
the grace of God took maybe 17 years, maybe 10, 17 years to work in Paul's life to bring this disagreement to a point of unity. I just want you to be the one that is on the grace side of the equation, not the hard-hearted side of the equation. Because the grace of God will empower the church to be a unified weapon against the enemy who is trying to tear us apart. He brings us together. Amen? So let me just remind you, in disagreements, Good people, people you may love, look for middle ground. Don't let the differences destroy love. And this last one, keep your focus on the important issues. I love this verse. I said it to you earlier. But what's really important is pleasing the Holy Spirit, <laughs> not winning the argument. I'm right. You're wrong. And if we live long enough, you're going to see it. No, look for, look for a solution that pleases. And you know what pleases the Holy Spirit? <laughs> when you live in unity, that pleases the Holy Spirit. That's why, that's why the conflict in Jerusalem or, the, or, or originated in Antioch ends with pleasing the Holy Spirit. And the conflict that was between Paul and Barnabas doesn't. This verse is not after Paul and Barnabas. This is they left and they were praying for the grace of God. Hope you do well. Because they were hard, or Paul at least was hard-hearted. And it took him a while to see the value of this young man. So they pleased the Holy Spirit. And then even Paul and Silas, when they, I mean, even Paul and Barnabas, when they couldn't agree who they would go with, they didn't like just give up and stop going. They did find a point of agreement. And that was that we're going to keep spreading the God. Well, okay, you take Mark. If you you got to have, I'm going to find somebody else. I'm going to find Silas. But I'm going to keep being doing the work of the Lord. So if you've got disagreements, hey, you could be a good person. Just make sure you're on the right side of the equation. Look for a middle ground. Look for a place where you can extend the grace of God. Don't let differences destroy love. That's very important right there. Make sure you, and make sure you keep focused on the things that are important. And the things that are important are things that please the Holy Spirit, things that empower the church, things that inspire the vision that God is giving to the church to be fulfilled, things that allow you to rise higher because your roots are down. And it, it's regularly getting together with God's people. This is why some people don't like small groups. Because in small groups, you can have disagreements. Some people like to come to church and just hide. I see you. you. You could just sail in, find your seat, sing some songs, listen to somebody, and sail out. Limited opportunity for disagreement. Probably because you've had some in the past. In fact, there are some people that didn't come to church today. Because somebody somewhere in their past in a church did something stupid. And it hurt them. And they've said, okay. But that's the work of the enemy to cause disagreement and division. It is the work of the Spirit to bring them together. So I want to encourage you in the moment when I bless you guys and send you out to like take a step of faith and go, okay, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to try one of these small groups out. I'm going to get into a place. Because the Bible says iron sharpens iron. There's something that happens in the rubbing of our lives together. There's something that takes place in the growth in that moment. So I encourage you to let iron sharpen iron, to have those conversations, and to overcome disagreements and invite something that pleases the Holy Spirit and brings unity to the body of Christ, because then we are unstoppable. Amen. Amen. Let me invite you to close your eyes and open your hearts. And the biggest disagreement in this room would not be with any person. The biggest disagreement people would have is with God. And I'd like to pray about that. That broken relationship with God. Maybe you had one at one time, but not today. Or maybe you've never had one. The most important thing in this room is that you would establish or reestablish your relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We do that through prayer. We admit we need help. We believe in Jesus. We confess Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. 
and we give our lives to him. So I'm going to lead in a, in a prayer, and would you just pray it with me? Would you just say out loud with all the people around you, Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name because I really need you in my life. I repent of my sins, and I leave them behind. And I turn towards you, Lord, to receive your love, your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness. Thank you for loving me and never giving up on me. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit. One more time. Now fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to follow Jesus every day of my life. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. Now, if you're making a decision, maybe online or here personally, if you text the word yes to 9 to 888-970-8081, we'll send you a free ebook, or you can pick one up at the Fresh Start Center. But we just want to help you to grow in the things of the Lord. Yeah. Let me just tell you, God isn't mad at you. God loves you more than you could even imagine. He longs for a relationship with you. And his life will give you the abundance that you truly, truly need in life to become all that God calls you to be. So in a moment, we'll, the worship team will lead us, and um, I'll encourage you to stop by the tables that are out in the lobby. It's really good to see you guys today. We love you so very much, and pray that the grace of the Lord would be with you. And in all of your relationships, just like you don't have to understand them all. Pray, great, Lord, great, I pray for grace for myself and for that person, and just keep praying for grace. There are some, I'll tell you, there are some relationships in my life that were broken years ago that have never been repaired. I, I would love them to be. I just want to make sure there's grace in my heart. That if they ever called, they ever reached out, I've reached out to them, that it would be a moment of grace. In Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Can we do that? I'm going to open my hands towards heaven as I pray this blessing. Encourage you to take the same position of prayer. It's a Bible way of praying. And so, Lord, here are your sons and here are your daughters. We want to listen to you and we want to be led by you. Jesus, speak to us. Give us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit would say to us about our lives, our relationship, the grace that we need. I pray that the Lord would bless you. I pray that the Lord will keep you. I pray that the Lord will cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. I pray that the God of hope will fill you with joy <laughs> and peace in your relationships. So you don't lean on your own understanding, but you trust in the Lord and you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I bless you in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, you are very blessed. Everybody says, Amen.